uh, I'm here kind of to do a clinic slash product demo for these remix symbols, and I like to sort of explain. Uh, how you doing? Hey, man. Uh, I want to explain the reason that these sort of came about. First of all, I want to ask how many of you are familiar with Show of Hands with some of this new music, uh, a lot of it that comes out of the UK, uh, drum and bass or techno or jungle stuff. Anyone familiar with that stuff? A few of you? Okay. So what ended up happening was I was in a project, I still am, called Bluth, which did uh, sort of a lot of electronic stuff, and we wanted to duplicate that when we played live. Okay, so, and most of this music that uh, comes out of the UK, the jungle stuff, the drum and bass, a lot of that is, if not, you know, 99% of it, I'd say, is programmed, which means sample drum sounds and uh, not a lot of real drums, although a lot of this, this style originated from taking, and I will play a tape of this uh, a little bit later, taking drum breaks at slower tempos, putting them in the sampler, and speeding up the tempo, which in turn raised the pitch of the drums and uh, the whole drum set seemed to kind of sound like more of a toy drum set. So I tried to duplicate this. I see there's a huge bass drum here, but they didn't have a tiny bass drum. Usually I play with an 18-inch bass drum, sometimes a 16-inch bass drum. And um, today we're going to have to believe that this is a little bit smaller than it is. But uh, I talked to Zildjian and I said, because I was using splashes for hi-hats and splashes for crashes and a crash for a ride just to bring the sound smaller. And uh, I did a gig, and a couple of guys from Zildjian saw it, and we s thought that maybe it'd be a nice idea to sort of just come out with something that was more fitting than just me using splash symbols for this style. And that's what these are about, although I would definitely like to say that they're not limited to the style of music that I just mentioned, the uh, techno and the trip hop and all that sort of stuff. And I like to use them for that, but they're definitely really good sounding cymbals and uh, have cover a wide range of styles. So what I'm going to do actually is warm up a little bit and just play, I guess, what maybe could be called a more traditional sort of solo, uh, and then go into a track. And I will advise everybody these tracks are pretty, pretty different from the normal tracks that uh, guys come out and play to at a clinic. And I'm still trying to feel my way around them myself, so it's, a, it's an experiment for me as well. But I'm going to play to that, then we'll uh, talk a little bit some more, and I have some examples of basically stuff that's become the tools for building this style of music in a program sense. We can all kind of hear that and see why the drums are trying to, uh, see what the drums are trying to emulate with that. So I will play a little bit. Hopefully the dat level is going to be cool and I'm going to hear the click because it's quite syncopated and at a very fast tempo and pretty treacherous if you get off with it. So give this a shot.
to a minute. It's hard to get the monitors working right. And I'm looking down because I realized that uh, headphones are going to fall off if I turn a certain way. So I've got to resolve that problem somehow. Um, time to figure that one out. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of technicalities with playing this stuff, at least the way I envision doing it. Uh, oh. Uh, I thought he was talking to me. Anyway, uh, a lot of this music is based on repetitive phrases and ridiculously complex drum programming. And uh, as you probably noticed by, by that last track. Uh, but what's required to play this stuff, as far as making it interesting from the drums, besides actually just physically being able to pull it off, um, Number one is getting the right drum sound. So I was trying to highlight, did everyone he sort of hear how these cymbals kind of blended in sonically with the track? Because uh, the, the drum sounds that are programmed are pretty typical of this style of music, which is pretty high pitched and uh, very processed and uh, in your face and short staccato drum sounds. So trying to get that is uh, priority number one in my book. Having a smaller bass drum would help that, but the snare drum is very important. And having the right processing on it so that it blends in with the track. Uh, I've done gigs with some groups that I'm in in New York, and the biggest problem with this is trying to get the drums to sound in sync with uh, the rest of the band and sound processed and sort of fit the mix because this is an electronic style of music and there's going to be those elements there. Like if you're just playing with a standard band, bass guitar and drums and what have you, and you're not playing with electronic sounds out of the drums. See, the problem is a lot of this stuff has programmed drums in it, so we want to get drums and cymbals that go with that. And I'm really happy with uh, what's come out as far as these cymbals for that. Uh, the thing about these cymbals, let's turn the effects off just for the hell of it. We have a gated, a gated reverb on these, I think. Okay. Uh, these are 12 inch hi-hats. And uh, I love them. And a lot, of, a lot of times I'll be playing these and checking the tape back after the gig. And sometimes I wasn't even sure if these were the synthesized hi-hats or my hi-hats. And when I heard that, I was like, great, this is, uh, this is a good thing because that's what we were trying to achieve. These hats, um, is it going to the house? they're uh, pretty fast decay on them, but they're still, they don't have a splashiness like other smaller sets of cymbals usually would have. Uh, they, they pack some beef to them, and they're small and they're quick, but yet they retain properties of like a bigger cymbal. The same thing with these crashes. This is a 14-inch crash, but kind of has a bigger sound than a 14. And uh, the 12... Department 104. I'll be right there. Um, uh, the 12-inch uh, crash, usually 12-inch uh, cymbals, tend to have a real like quick splashiness and thinness to them. We wanted to make something that was a little darker. And the ride, we wanted to kind of have a real kind of focused pinginess with not a lot of overtones underneath it. So that you can hear the accentuation, but not have it like ring. And I'm used to playing cymbals that have a lot of wash, and I like that for many things, but for this, I didn't really want a uh, cymbal with a lot of wash. So these cymbals work great for that. And uh, like I said, usually it's in conjunction with a smaller drum set. I rarely hit the toms when I play this stuff. And, what, and the toms I usually use are an eight inch and a 10 inch, and not that uh, this is that far off, but still it, it feels a little different because the whole set is kind of like a scale of uh, a bigger drum set. And like I said, the bass drum is, uh, sounds pretty standard. We want to get that in the range of the other drums. Usually it's an 18-inch bass drum, uh, or a 16 even, that a, a floor toms that convert into bass drums have often uh, given a good sound. I, I made a bass drum out of a floor tom, and I'm using that a lot. So that's basically the premise behind these cymbals. Uh, I have a couple of other tracks that I will be playing too in a little bit. But I uh, want to know if there's any questions about any of this that we've discussed so far. I encourage any, any questions. Yes, sir? What does the bell of the ride sound like? Okay. What does the bell of the, round, the ride sound like? 
This one? Yeah. Okay. I don't use it that much with this stuff, but the bell... Can everyone hear this? And it's got a small bell on it. I think the bigger the bell, the more overtones they're going to be on the cymbal. Uh, and you know how flat top rides, they, they have the ping and not a lot of uh, residual overtones. This has a pretty small bell, but, but it's there. That's what that sounds like. Um, people hiding behind the, the keyboards and the guitars. And Anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Was it hard to convince Zildjian to, to do something like this, or were they, were they pretty up for it? It's a good question. Um, well, when it, like I said, I, I did a gig with cymbals that were trying to be like these, and a couple of guys saw it, and I, I said, you know what, it'd be great if I can get a ride cymbal that's smaller than even 18 or something like that, like a 16-inch ride or something. That, and I said, sure, yeah, we'll, we'll doctor something up. And usually that means they'll give me one and that'll be the end of it. And I was going to be happy with that. But then a few months later they had spoken to me and said, you know, this sounds like a cool idea and this sort of stuff. Like in the UK, there are drummers playing this stuff a lot more than here. And there are some bands uh, doing this with live drummers. Uh, and one of the guys who works Brazilian is really up to date on a lot of what's going on over there. So when he heard more guys were doing that, he said to me, well, be nice to come out with some stuff and can we work on it? So I didn't even, I wasn't even looking to have symbols made really like to be marketed by any means, but they went for the idea. I mean, I come from uh, a background of the stuff I usually do. I'm just happy with a 20 inch K, you know, for most things. This wasn't, uh, this is one thing when I, did some stuff. I'm in a band called Bluth, and we did an album, and I recorded on what I referred to as a toy drum set, but it was basically, like I said, smaller cymbals and a small drum set. And the guy really enjoyed the album, and sort of, it all came together at the right point. So I don't, it wasn't, it was pretty, uh, pretty much a coincidence that I brought that up to them, because they were kind of thinking similar ideas. So that's the story with that. Any general questions about uh, drums, cymbals, drumming? Sports, anything else? Yes. Are these all the symbols that they make uh, along this line? Until you guys call them up and say, let's make a China symbol, let's make uh, other symbols. Yeah, this is it for now. Um, yeah, 12 and 14 inch crashes, 17 inch ride, and, and the hi hats. You have any ideas? I'll go back and tell them. What size would you want? How about a gong? A gong? <laughs> what, like a 14 inch gong that would duplicate a 60 inch? I can tell them. Is the Zildjian rep here tonight? No, he's not here. A 14-inch gong. Hey, you know, could happen. What's your name? I'll put it on the symbol. Benjamin. All right, it's going to be the Benjamin gong. That's what we're going to do. Uh, I got a two-inch splash. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, this is, I'm sure not many of, how many of you, I know one person has, heard of a band called Bluth? Has anybody heard of it? Really? How many has heard it? Yeah? And you're still here? That's right. <laughs> I got my copy from him. Oh, I, I see. You two are in cahoots. Uh-huh. He owes you money. He owes me money. No, I, I have CDs on me if anyone's interested afterwards. And to talk about weird material, huh? Garbanzo Bean Records. Garbanzo Bean Records. That's right. Um, there's this project called Bluth, and it's... What we went for is to just kind of like, I don't know, do whatever the hell we wanted, actually, and not try to even care what anyone would think of it. And it kind of sounds like that, but we took liberties that we knew if we posed it to a producer, they'd think we were crazy, but now it's like turning out, we're like, it's getting- Warehouse dial uh, uh, 206, warehouse 206, please. Okay. Been told to keep quiet while that was said, no. Uh, now it's to the point where people have heard it and we've gotten people who are interested in doing something with it, and we knew that if we sort of told people in the beginning stages, this is what we have an idea for for a record, they'd laugh us out of the room. So we went ahead and just did whatever we wanted, but it's uh, kind of a, I don't even know how to describe it. It's, it's comedic, it's very uh, comedy oriented stuff. Is it all electronic? No, no, uh, I'd say it's half and half. And uh, it's gotten some interesting reviews. Varying styles and so on? Varying styles. There's, there's a heavy metal tune on there, well, you know, a heavy metal mock tune that goes into a reggae thing at the end. There's, there's hip-hop stuff, there's 
there's jungle drum and bass stuff on there. There's acid jazz. There's whatever you can think of, and it's style really, zero really zero uh, zero zero parental zero discretion is advised, though, <laughs> shall I say? But uh, I brought some with me as they're not at Tower Records here. I didn't even go look, but I don't think they're at Tower Records here. So uh, I have some if anyone's interested. But uh, and I will be playing a couple of tracks from that, depending on how risky I feel. I'll pull out something called the Boom Tune. Uh, I don't know. To, don't know if that rings a bell to you, but it's it's uh, sort of mocking how drummers like to sing what other drummers play, and that's sort of the premise behind that. And I'll see if I'm bold enough to attempt that in a minute or so, but uh, we might try that. Anybody else? Let me just pick on people here. And uh... yeah, how come you don't just trigger or use an electronic set for that kind of stuff? Okay. The uh, question was, how, my, how come I use an electronic set? This brings me to the, uh, I'm going to play something in a minute about how this style, you know, the, uh, an example of how this style is produced and constructed. But the reason I don't play an electronic drum set, uh, I've toyed with the idea. I've done a half acoustic, half electronic. Sometimes we've done gigs where we take uh, certain drum loops and they're triggered on pads. And I play along with that or where there's certain individual hits. And as you can see, there's a trigger dangling off this snare drum. If I want to put like a weird sound on it or a more electronic sound on top of it, uh, I'll do that. So we do do that sometimes. But playing a purely electronic set, I don't find it as fun as playing acoustic drums. Um, um, I know we're staring at a, at a uh, very beautiful set over there. That's very expensive as well. And they're great. Uh, but. I, I prefer, if I'm going to play drums, to, to play drums with it, you know? Something about hitting those things, I don't know, I just, I was never a huge fan. I like it for practice reasons. Uh, although the Yamaha set I, I have, and I, I play it and I have a lot of fun, so who am I talking about? What am I saying? But yeah, for this stuff, anyway, I want to try to bring it out so that there's live drums playing over it, because there's already enough of a programmed element to just contribute to that with electronic sounds only. Uh, it's not exciting right now for me, but we're all experimenting. There's a very experimental f stuff going on musically with the, all this new stuff, yeah? Do you practice with a click in order to make sure your timing is perfect? Because I know playing with sequence loops, you know, you, 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 the adrenaline starts pumping during a gig, and you start maybe, you know, start rushing, and all of a sudden you realize you're, you're off the sequence, and then, you know, then it's all gone. Well, it's all gone. yeah. Um, personally, I, I haven't been practicing a lot with these loops as much as I should. Uh, of course. See, a lot of what's characteristic of this style of music is the tempos, the BPM. They're in the 160 and up range. Okay? This music, uh, drum and bass anyway, jungle drum and bass, is notorious for having tempos 160, 170, 180. The thing I played was about 175, I believe. And, and it's not a finesseful 175, okay? Because, like, in playing, well, it, it takes a, it takes a definite precision because you are playing with machines and it's very syncopated and those machines that are syncopated are right on the money. So you can't casually just be like floating around it. Uh, and that makes it difficult. Um, but yeah, to play with a click to this stuff is, or even just to play with these tracks. I want to play for you uh, an example of a drum break that's commonly used in this style and play you like basically the original tempo that it was at, then play you the tempo that it's usually used in this genre, and then play you a track of, uh, of a tune in that genre that's utilizing these uh, drum breaks. What's, what I'm gonna play you is I think a two or three bar drum break at the regular tempo, then sped up, and then what guys do, let me give you an example real quick. I'm gonna leave this on. What programmers do, and I'm trying to duplicate this drumistically. Oh, I don't need the headsets. Like if you if you're gonna take a pattern that just goes like this. Um, okay. Okay. If that's your drum loop, guys will. Does everyone know what a sampler is? I'm going to bring it down to, a, I don't want to just assume that like everyone goes, oh, okay, you sample that. And you, a, does everyone, a sampler is a, a machine that you can record. Uh, it's basically a recorder, and then you can re-trigger it and program it and use it 
as, as you would any other sort of keyboard or drum machine sound. The guys would sample a one bar loop. So something like that again. Okay, then they will take that loop and cut it. A lot of times they will cut it into quarter note pieces. So you'll have one piece that just sounds like this. And you'll hit a key on your keyboard and you'll just get. Uh, they'll cut the second uh, set of second chord notes, which would be. Okay, so you'd have. Uh, I'm trying to remember the pattern I played. Third piece will be again like this. And the fourth piece will be again. So they will take these pieces and sometimes cut them up in, even into smaller fragments of eighth notes or sometimes just extract just the snare hit or just the ghost hit and reprogram these patterns to get diff, uh, different syncopations off the pattern. So what I'm going to play you is an example of that as well. Jungle stuff. This is almost like um, a sax player knowing how to solo over giant steps. I mean, that's like the, one of the standard breaks that people steal and use for the tune. So, but that's the original tempo, pretty much, of what the drummer played it on a recording by a group called the Winstons, like in 1971. That was the tempo it was at, which is a little more human, a little more doable. And what they've done with it is jacked it up uh, considerably. So I'm going to play you that right now. Okay, so when that happens, it's sort of like, you know, speed on your tape recorder on your turntable going from 33 to 45, and everything gets sped up. And hence, that's why my drum is 10 inches and not 14, and that's what, you know what I mean, uh, to try to get that sped up sound. So now what I have on tape is those little pieces, those little fragments, a couple of those pieces, just so you can get an idea of what these pieces are when they're cut up. That's one piece. Okay, so it sounds really stupid, but these pieces are then repeated and reprogrammed. Like, for example, if one piece, and this is what makes it hard for drummers to have to play something like this. If you take just that second piece, uh, this, or I think this is something like the second piece, okay? But if you repeat that, it's going to be, okay, so you got like, uh, Okay. And a lot, of, a lot of drum programming in the genre is based on repeating a lot of these pieces. And you'll get, you'll get rhythms that just sound like they're skipping or they're repeating, and that's uh, very much uh, a technique used in this programming. So us as drummers might be playing this and realizing that it's a little unorthodox because sometimes you'll have like more than two notes in the left hand on a very drumistic technical level, you'll realize that, wait a minute, uh, this is something we don't normally do, okay? Because if you played something like this, okay, that sounds, that might be pretty common to play, but if you were to just cycle that second part, you got like three notes in the left hand with the second note accented, and that's not the most conventional thing to play, it's not the easiest thing to play. To go, and, and to do it, with the same almost control of a, of a machine, which does it the same way every single time. Do you know what I mean? So it's not something like playing double strokes and kind of wishy-washing, you know. You want to make them where every double stroke set, if you're going to play that repetitive, where they kind of sound the same or as close to the same. So that's the whole challenge with this. But I'm going to play you uh, uh, a tune that incorporates this drum loop, and you'll hear how the variations lead to a lot of different stuff.
times in there, there's, I noticed, three bass drums in a row, and that's what makes it uh, hard for drummers, because we wouldn't think of playing certain things like that. But the reason that, that they get these patterns like that is because, A, because they can, you know, because it's no skin off their back. They're not slaving to play it, literally. But you get some weird combinations when you chop things up and rearrange the pieces. And uh, it's, it's definitely a challenge to being able to... Uh, recreate that, and I'm working on, on that side of things as well, but uh, first, uh, first and foremost, you notice how the drums don't sound like conventional drums, because they're sped up, although originally it came from a drum groove that was physically played by a human being on a regular sounding drum set, but they, it's been manipulated so much and resampled and added with effects and re-EQ'd and re-pitched and re-everything that it sounds quite electronic, but uh, to try to... Uh, bring it back now, uh, a lot of people say, why do you, um, it's so weird to have cymbals that are trying to sound like machines when drum machines were, cymbals are trying to sound like real cymbals and now you're trying to sound like machine cymbals, but uh, I think it's kind of cool uh, to try to, the machines have definitely influenced drumming. No, I don't think that's what they set out to do, they set out to replace drums and uh, sort of convince the listener that they were hearing sort of drums, but uh, and we're seeing a trend now, like drum machines that were not very popular when they came out or were not as desirable at the time, like uh, Roland TR-808s and uh, Roland made a bunch of old gear, something called a TB-303, and it was a bass synthesizer that I guess was meant to, you know, reproduce bass lines, but it had a real synthetic feel and sound. And they sold for like 200 or $300 when they came out. It's a little box, a little gray box. Now they're selling used for about $1,500 because they're hot again. And now they're making all these sort of synths right now, all the companies, and even computer software is coming out. There's a thing called Rebirth that's supposed to emulate the TR-808 drum machine and the TB-303 bass line. And uh, it's just so funny how something that was considered corny or wasn't cutting the mustard or whatever has now become so popular. But uh, hold on, if anyone's got that stuff, hold on to it. Or maybe sell it now, because maybe it'll be out of style in a couple of years. But, uh, in any event, so that's sort of the sort of the premise behind how this stuff is programmed and produced, and uh, definitely the the key ingredients that the drums are very syncopated and also not at their normal pitch. So, uh, a couple of you guys said you've sort of been familiar with the style, right? I'm just curious to see what, what you've heard of it or any albums specifically off the top of your heads that you guys uh, listen to. Any any. Uh, Anything particular? No. Just like heard it in a club or uh, on a BMW commercial or what have you. Yeah? Question. Yeah. Um, okay, say a band, you look, at, look at a band like U2, and they're like going into all this electronic sounds now. Yeah, they are. I haven't heard the latest stuff, but I've been told that, yeah. Yeah, um, well, a lot of the stuff sounds like just what you're playing. Okay. And so, well, but if you, don't, if you haven't heard it, then you haven't heard it. But. But I mean, I'm just saying, it sounds similar. Yeah. Like, like that type of techno type beat. Right. Yeah, U2 has been doing it. David Bowie did it recently. Madonna's last album. Um, Eric Clapton's new single, actually. Eric Clapton's new single, I heard also. It will have that. Um, something like that. I, I'd heard about that. It's getting more and more popular. And even in New York, where um, you'd figure like New York is doing a lot of this stuff, even in New York, it's not really big yet. In the UK, you go over to London, and I got turned on to this music from a friend of mine about two years ago, and I went over there two years ago to uh, to London, and you know everyone knew what it was. But back in the States, here, uh, it's not it's not big yet. It's getting there, and it's still kind of underground, but it will definitely get here if it hasn't already. But it's it's getting here, so. Uh, do you find that it gets repetitive to play this stuff over and over again, or is it more of a challenge and you don't look at it as kind of, it's my personal opinion, I've never been a big fan. Okay. It just seems like it, you know, drum and bass seems so repetitive that it, there's, there's no, it doesn't break anywhere, you know what I mean? And I, I can see that, it, you, know, you know, you definitely need some skill to be able to hang with this stuff if you're playing an acoustic kit live with samples and CDs yeah. and, and so forth, but you do find that, you, do you search for other outlets to kind of, you know, break out of this mold? Okay, well, like anything else, uh, you mentioned the word jazz to people, and some people say Kenny G. You know what I mean? <laughs> some people say Miles Davis. Some people say uh, 
the Rippingtons, I don't know. Everyone's got their definition. Same thing with this stuff. What I just played you right now, and I don't want to insult the artist who I was playing, and in, to be quite honest with you, it's off a compilation, and I thought, oh, I think I know who it is, but uh, anyway. This might be the more friendly jungle stuff, what we're listening to right now. There is stuff by guys like Aphex Twin, uh, a guy named Plug, a guy named Square Pusher that's like, is jazz to somebody Kenny G or is it Ornette Coleman? You know what I mean? There's two sides. Same with this stuff. And so to answer your question, there's stuff in this genre that's less popular, of course, uh, just like Ornette Coleman's less popular than Kenny G, but there's stuff in this genre that's ridiculously varying, incessant change. I mean, more so than in any other style I've ever heard. There's nuances, the bar to bar is different. And, uh, you know, and a lot of those guys don't even want to be termed as jungle drum and bass just because the style that most people hear is the repetitive drum loop that keeps going and meandering for the dance clubs. The stuff I'm talking about is very out there and might not be suitable for most uh, listening audiences, but it, it's out there. I mean, people are putting out recordings. A uh, guy named Fotech, he takes a lot of great drum programming, uh, drum stuff, and there's always some sort of variance. And what's really great about this stuff is there's not only variance rhythmically, but there's sonic variance, like uh, filters put through the drums or multi-effects put through the drums, and uh, that's something I'm working on. I have some effects here, but I don't have control to them, and I didn't get enough of a chance to really mess around with getting that together. But there's many things you could do uh, I'm working on back at home with foot switches to turn effects on and often to change patches so that you'll go from a gated reverb to a delay to something that's more like a distortion effect and you can change that up even for a bar or two and it's a lot easier when you program this because you don't have to do it in real time and you can say okay bar 46 of this sequence and the sequence let's insert this effect or let's bring you know there's just so much that can be done that me personally I mean I, I would have to say that the, the drum programming on this stuff that I've been checking out has been more inspiring to me these days than any live drummer could do. Where I, I go and hear live drummers and I go, is that all you could do? You know what I mean? And it is all they could do in a way. There's just so much great stuff that could be done with the programming. And I think more importantly, what, what is going to happen is you're going to just need some complementary drums with this other programming. Do you know what I mean? And, uh, bands are going out where they have the loops playing and they just want the drummer to sort of reinforce that with something over the top. And yeah, just add a, a, a sort of more uh, live sound, but you don't have to go as nuts as the drum programming that's part of this music. But I'm starting to see there are live drummers playing to these loops and, uh, uh, you know, not trying to always emulate the loops, but sort of just counteract them. And uh, a, lot, a lot of this music, when you go hear it live, it's, it's strange. You'll, you'll see these guys, and they don't even play with mixing boards. I mean, they don't, even play with, they, do, they don't even play with instruments, they play with mixing boards. They come out, they have their stuff on ADATs or on computers, and they just do live mixes on stage, and there's a big light show and, and slides going on in the back or some sort of animation. And all their music is pre-programmed, and they're just basically doing a live mix. And I've worked with some guys who do this, and there really is, you know, you may say, okay, it's just a mixing world, but there's a true art to this, the same way there's an art to playing an instrument. And uh, a lot of DJs who spin this stuff, there's, uh, I've been meeting a couple of guys, and what they do is really amazing. I mean, they'll take an ambient tune that doesn't have drums, and then like a specific album that has a lot of drums, and they'll do live mixes back and forth and create sort of a, a complete piece of music from two records. and. You know, years ago I thought a DJ just put on a record and you know just waited around till the next one was ready to go. But there's a whole thing going on with this that's really creative and inspiring. I mean, I go and listen to this more than I listen to, uh, you know, just standard configurations of stuff. So, uh, but there are groups. There's a group called Propeller Heads that go and they play over their own loops and it sounds great. Drummer plays. Uh, he has his turntables, he plays his music, and then he runs to the drum set and plays over the top of them, and that sounds really great. And uh, you know, I'm starting to see a lot more of this, but for me, it's very inspiring. Uh, it's definitely a lot more inspiring than the last 10 years of music that I've heard prior. I think this is finally something fresh. A lot of people are uninspired. I was uninspired for a long time, and 
I'm totally inspired. So much so that it's like I'm manic about it. So, and uh, it's an uneasy feeling being too excited, but that's where I'm at right now. I mean, I'm boring everybody to tears, but anyway. Uh, yes, sir. You're touching on that uh, kid just, I think it was like maybe three weeks ago. I, I thought mm -hmm. I heard everything there is to hear. And he came up to me and said, have you have heard of this jungle music or whatever? What so I said, no, nah, well, what is it? Kind of, uh, you know, I know a lot of rhythms. Come some melody. He says, well, I can't do it. I just got to let you, you know, listen to, you know, let, let you listen to the tapes. So I took the tape home. And uh, the first part of it was kind of jazzy. Then it broke out with something. Just I was like, whoa. So I just mad stopped, you know, got in touch the next day, returned him his tape back. And, but then when I found when I got my invitation that you were going to be here, and I've been listening to you for a long time with the Chuck Lowe stuff, with oh, yeah. Krantz, and to see that, you know, it kind of brought back, like, whoa, what's what the jungle stuff? Now that, you know, you're doing a clinic on it, uh, it's kind of different. Yeah. And, uh, so how long, how long has jungle music been out? Okay, yeah. Uh, j it, it, the UK has been doing, the guys in the UK have been doing this for maybe six, seven years already. I got turned on to it about two years ago. Um, and at that point, it had already been around two, three years easily. So it definitely five years, but it, it kind of like, like any other style evolved. Before Jungle, there was sort of like pre techno y jungle stuff, you know, and stuff that maybe right now could even though it was called techno then, maybe you can call it jungle now, and all these labels they give to this stuff, hardcore and jump up and raga and blah, 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 there's all these names, and a lot of guys will go, oh yeah, well the distinction is with this, it's that, and hardcore it's this, and jump step and hard this, and blah, 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 you know. Uh, I think it's a marketing you know, ploy, of course, but uh, a DJ friend of mine was funny because he said he went to a record store and he saw like a DJ would put on a record and they go, Nah, I'm not digging this. You know, he put on a record sound that's identical. It's like, now that's the stuff I'm digging. You know, it's just, this is hardcore. Like, meanwhile, he didn't even know the difference between the two styles. Uh, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty funny all the names they give to this. But I'd say it's been around an easy six, seven years. Are you getting any flack from other drummers? Uh, you know, doing this type of music. Not a lot of guys are doing this yet. Right, okay. Yet is the word. Damon, you have they will. One, four, nine. And Damon, uh, one, four, nine. I, as far as getting flack for what, why am I doing this? Yeah, I mean, well, because I mean, you do a lot of, lot of fusion. Yeah. Like that, so. Yeah. From a traditional standpoint, this is not, right. you know, this is not conventional drawing by any means. No, it's not. Um, thank God. Uh, <laughs> for, for me, uh, I play the drums and playing, like, even that little solo I took. I wish I didn't have to take that solo, you know, and, and I don't know if I, if, uh, I just, for me, it, it's like, I, I don't I want to move forward with stuff, you know, and I haven't, I've been listening to this stuff for the last couple of years, I've been programming a lot of it, and I still get called to do sessions where it requires a more standard thing, and being a side man, your job is to do what you're called to do, and I'll gladly play what's required, I'm not going to like, play this stuff over a session that I should be playing differently over. So I'll respect all genres of music, but for me, if I was going to come out with something on my own as a leader or be involved in something with a group of guys, I would want to make it something that was refreshing for me to do. And right now it's that. I mean, I'm in a rock band right now uh, that's coming out in a couple of weeks with a record called Vaganza, and the, their music is very like uh, Queen meets Frank Zappa, and it's like glam rock coming back again. And I'm part of that. What, but what I really like about that is, well, there'll be costumes and makeup, and you know, so we'll see how that works with me. But uh, I'm kind of looking forward to that. But uh, there's, it's kind of, in a weird way, the music is challenging. Uh, and I get to, like, I like to, uh, and this has been happening for me for a couple of years, and this is why this Bluth CD came out. I've been wanting to play the drums in a funny way for a long time, in a comedic way. And I think I'm going to pull, I'm going to bring this tune out in a minute. I'm going to just let it fly and see what happens. But uh, I like playing drums in a funny, comedic way and doing little fills that sound out of place or stupid, you know, for the effect. I really enjoy doing that. That's, that's you know, that's inspiring for me. Uh, so this band, Vaganza, kind of wants me to do that. So I said, hey, I'll do this gig. This is great. So I'm doing that. Uh, and I'm also playing with a lot of different other little projects that are, you know, a little more what you'd call traditional or uh, the norm. And not to insult 
those people who are, you know, not that their music's normal, but you know, more conventional style drumming with their regular sized drum set. But for me, I'm just happy doing something where I can experiment. I mean, I almost was going to tape this tom up to sound like cardboard for the sound. I mean, I was going to do this and mic that in a certain way and EQ it and put a certain effect on it and get creative. We didn't have a, a, a lot of time where I could really get in there and mess around with that, but that's what I was thinking about, making these drums sound like awful. At the sound check, they were saying, wait a minute, your snare sounds like there's no body or tie. I said, great. I said, keep, keep it there, you know what I mean? <laughs> Like your bass drum sounds like crap. I said, good. I said, that's what we're going for. You know? I said, Is, do you have any ideas to make it sound worse? Let's do that. You know, that's what I was hoping for. But they put a muffler in there and made it sound a little bit more uh, like a bass drum. But I'm ready for it to sound like anything. So I'm gonna try these tunes. This and I've never played with this tune before. It's called the boom tune, but it's start it's gonna start off with uh, another track more in this sort of I call this a fusion techno tune that I'm about to play, but then it goes into a tune called the boom tune. I just want to brief you what you're going to hear because it's so bizarre, just so you realize it is and you don't go, wait a minute, this is weird. It is weird. Uh, a friend of mine named Pete Davenport, who's in this band Bluth, who wanted to come on this trip with me, and he would have been a barrel of laughs, and I wish he was here, but uh, we, uh, I don't know how this came about, but in essence what it is is, the way drummers sort of try to sing things that other drummers play, like, you know, the drummer you play, I heard him play, it was like, oh, doom, da, 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 you know. We took it to an extreme and really had fun with it and got really crazy with it. And another thing about this track, it's the second part of the track I'm gonna play with, is I like playing drums with things that's, in a way that sounds, it's not subdivisions. Uh, let me explain this real quick, just so that when I do it, you'll understand. Uh, subdivisions, like when people play and you have your quarter note, a subdivision would be any sort of equal grouping within that quarter note. So if you have 16th notes, those are four equal notes. You have triplets, would be, you know, they're all equal. So most, I'd say, conventional way of playing is to play with some form of subdivision, no matter what you do, or, gr or combinations of subdivisions. Like if I'm going to go... I'm just going between triplets and sixteenths and thirty seconds or what have you. Uh, but then there's also a way that I like to play where I'm just keeping a, still a chord note pulse or referring to one if I'm not actually marking time on the hi-hat, but playing a little bit more free within those chord note pieces. So almost where it might sound like you're stretching time or, or bending the beat or playing like uh, you're throwing a pile of books down a staircase or something like that. And I like to do that as well. So. Uh, a lot of this tune, the second half of this tune, is going to feature drumming that sounds like that. But it's not purposely playing bad. It's that I am, I'm actually not randomly hitting things. I'm, I'm hearing this stuff, which is quite scary to even myself. This is what I'm hearing in my head. And uh, uh, the, a lot of people have asked me, is this something that is a certain grouping or subdivision? And anything, I'll tell you right now, can be transcribed. I knew a guy who transcribed fireworks. He put a click to it and he transcribed it. And uh, anything can be transcribed. It, it, it might be outrageous groupings of, you know, weird, like a group of 17 notes over three beats with beats 3, 16, and 17 being accented. But if I'm playing something like that, you got to understand I'm not thinking of it like that. I'm, I'm hearing a phrase and hearing time over the phrase and trying to group like that. So I'm going to give this tune a whirl. It's very bizarre, and uh, we'll see what happens. Now, this mix, just so you know. No, no, this, okay. This mix does not have a backwards. The both channels can go through the main. It's a stereo mix. And there's no click, and it's just it's this simple. I guess just getting a level on my phones. Thank <laughs> you. 
was actually freaking myself out playing that track. I don't, I've never done that live before, and I'm quite ashamed of myself. Um, that's the Zach I know. What's that? That's the Zach you know. Um, yeah, that's me and my buddy sort of... I'm playing a drum phrase, and he's kind of humorously scatting it back at me. And... Uh, Boy, I wish he was here live. We could have done that. Uh, we're, we're working up a live rendition of that tune. The drums and voice. And uh, that's going to be interesting. But uh, yeah, I, I, like, I like playing drums to stuff that, that feels like... Uh, let me show you what I mean. There's, there's two ways that I like to play. One way is metric, where every sort of fill would sort of be something that's familiar to... Uh, or familiar to notation, you know, or could be notated like this. Now, they both kind of make rhythmical sense, and they're both done over a pulse that I'm hearing in my head that's a chord note either way, but some are a little more staying with the common subdivisions to that pulse, others are kind of phrasing loosely and uh, I like to do both, and uh, a lot of mainly jazz drummers have been doing that or playing really sort of like free to interpretation for many many years. Uh, it hasn't really approached the uh, the more contemporary scene as much, but I see no reason why it can't. And uh, kind of an interesting thing to have things that are sort of static, rhythmically in the electronic sense but playing loosely over that, over like that track which was in metronomically, metronomic time, but to phrase loosely over that sometimes gives that metronomic thing a, more of a human sway to it. So uh, I like to mess around with that as well. Any other uh, questions that come about? Yes? If you were to write that, would that be breakups of fives and sevens over the bar line? Okay. That's, a, that's exactly what I was talking about 10 minutes ago. If I, he asked if I were to write that out, would that be groupings of fives or sevens over the bar line? If it is, I certainly don't know. But uh, groups of fives and sevens, let me show you what that is. And I haven't done this in a while. At one point, I was really into this and got and understood it a lot more. But if groups of five, meaning uh, septuplets or, or cross rhythmic fives. There's a difference. Safe tuplets, uh, if you have a chord, chord note pulse, five notes to the quarter. So I can go. That's groups of five, groups of fives, septuplets, phrased. Septuplets phrased in groups of four, actually, is what that is. If you want to phrase 16th notes in groups of five, you have your 16th notes. And that's like, uh, if you're going. Groups of fives and 16th notes. Um, septuplets, I mean, what am I talking septuplets all the Quintuplets. Pardon me. It's been a long drive. Uh, quintuplets. I'm sorry. Everything I said septuplets to, let's go quintuplets. Um, he's videotaping just for the video. Uh, okay. Quintuplets. If I were to do that as quintuplets, it would sound like this. Uh, that's group five notes to the quarter. This falling down the stairs thing is neither one of those. It's hearing a chord note pulse and sort of just independently hearing random notes over it. Um, here's, here's what I'm talking about. If I'm going like this. That's just taking something and speeding up that same phrase over the same pulse. Like I said, that could be notated just as fireworks can, but it's, that would be extremely difficult and time-consuming 
to, to bother with. I just view it as here's my pulse and I'm going to decide to play that against it. What that is, as far as the rhythmic values of each note, I could not tell you that. And that doesn't make it invalid, it just makes it coming from a place, you know, uh, they often said you can't transcribe Elvin Jones's phrases. Sure, you could, but it would be, it almost defeats the purpose of what he's trying to do, which is to hear a phrase and bend the time and, and phrase loosely. So I'm thinking more like that when I play. The Chuck Loeb stuff that he referred to, I used to play very metrically more so on that because a lot of stuff was the sequencers and all the phrases I used to play were more in sync, such as, Even phrases that were just divided up, but they were still metrically constant and not so stuttering, you know? How about like the Wayne Kranz, the uh, two fake metal? Okay. Same example. Um, um, it, what, any tune that you refer to? or? All of them. Like. All of them. <laughs> All right, so let's start with tune number one, which... Uh, uh, that, 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 again, was a lot more metric. Uh... The stuff on this blue CD is a combination of metric and really out there. And what we tried to do with this, the whole CD, see, even this goes for any instrument, not just drums. Uh, a lot of horn players, uh, a lot of times when they just want to phrase a, a melody, they see a tune to play on a chart, and the, and the rhythms of those tunes are very much open for interpretation. They try to get more personal with it and slur the notes around and, and sort of bend the melody and make a personal phrase. And I find that a lot of times when they solo over things, they're just like going back to this metric, da 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 So we, for this album, told a lot of guys what we wanted and got them to, on all instruments, to play the way I'm describing now, which is a more, let the time exist and play around it and play off of it. And uh, I haven't heard a lot of records like that where guys are doing that. So I thought that this was a first to hear a constant theme of that running through this particular CD that I'm talking about. Um, and that's a lot, of, a lot of stuff I've been exploring. The jungle stuff, on the other hand, is not quite that. That's going back to the metric and lay it all there. So that's kind of a contradiction of the stuff I just played. But that's, that's uh, the flip side of that. So that's where my metric stuff will come back into play, where I have to sound more precise with everything. OK. Uh, anything else come to mind? Out of curiosity, what's your educational background? My educational background? Uh, fifth grade was about it for me. No. Uh, I, I studied uh, at a school called the Drummers Collective in New York. You're talking musical background. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I didn't go to any college for music. I went to a place called the Drummers Collective in New York and studied seriously until I was about 14 years old and then on and off with little lessons here and there for a few years after. But I started to work professionally pretty regularly at 16 years old, 16, 17, so I was, I was contemplating going to college, not even for music, but just college in general, and everyone's like, if you want your musical career to just keep going steady, don't do that. So I didn't do that, and uh, they all lied, my musical career didn't go, no, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, I, I just kind of stopped taking lessons at 14 or 15, because what I wanted to do at that time, I felt I could learn on my own a little bit more by going to clubs and hearing guys play, and uh, it's not to say it's not good to take lessons because it's always good, but if you don't balance that with like trying to rely on your own talent, your own ear, to go check something out for yourself and figure it out, uh, the understanding doesn't really stay with you. I mean, people say to learn a foreign language, it's best to go to that country and just absorb yourself, you know, around this. Same thing with learning an instrument, I believe. It's like, uh, what's happening, and I, and I mean, I love the fact that there's a lot of musical music videos out there with drummers, but what ends up happening is everybody gets those same materials to work with, and it's all kind of laid out on a platter for everybody. They're just, okay, here's what I played on this tune, that tune, and there's no searching and there's no discovering on your own. You go and hear something live, and you might take something from it, and a guy who's also there watching the same thing takes something totally different from it. But these videos and stuff are so like, well, here's this, here's that. And you're almost left, you don't have to make any decisions yourself. You just kind of like, it's just fed to you. 
pretty easily, and I think that could backfire in Where developing one, one style. Four. Where else you know? one six four. Like this guy, I know he didn't hear a tape of other guys doing that job. I could just tell. He's, you know, he's got a feel for it. Um, he, you know, I'm sure he went to other stores, but he never, never got videos or anything. I'll tell you that. Um, so, but you know what I mean. I think it's a, it's a good thing to sort of go out on your own and say, okay, no one's, no one's showing me that I have to learn this or telling me, but I like this, and I'm going to decide. Uh, go for obscure things. That don't just say, okay, I want to hear Dennis Chambers. I'll buy a Dennis Chambers video on the quintessential Dennis Chambers album, which I don't even know what that would be, but they're all really good. But you know what I mean. It's like, go out and try to like get something that's that's going up an extra step rather than just being content with. I knew guys who like would open up Modern Drummer for transcriptions, and they wouldn't even have heard the record that they're referring to. they just say, oh, it's a drum solo, and this guy played it. It must be good. And they're not even kind of like exploring what that was. They're just looking at the phrases, which half the time are wrong in that magazine, or, or ha used to be anyway. And they're playing this stuff, and I'm like, hey, I know that that's not right, because I checked this solo out eight billion times with my ears with the slowdown machine and you know every which way and it's not just like glanced upon a modern drum okay triplet into this I mean you know in fact they did an article a couple of years ago where I wrote in something and I wrote it wrong and no one told me it was I I looked at it and I discovered holy yeah oh, I, I made a mistake on that but you know a lot of people read the article but no one said you know that third example in that playing for the rate thing that's wrong like, like there's too many notes in that bar. If you look real closely, like there was like dotted notes or that shouldn't have been dotted or something got wrong, but uh, I sent it in that way. I, like I, I did it real quick on my computer and I messed it up, but uh, no one came up to me and noticed that. And I thought that was kind of scary because they just accepted it, do you know what I mean? And I think it's always good to never, not to be skeptical, but it's always like make sure that you're getting it right with these things of modern drummer. Always listen, at least listen to why the drummer played it, listen to the tune it's coming from. So go that extra distance whenever possible because I think it'll give you a little more of an edge on guys who don't do that, you know, like anything else, I guess. Uh, anybody else here? Everyone's shaking their head now. Come on, yeah. Well, what's the size of the snare you're playing? It's a 10 inch drum. Two boards, 149. 10 inch. Uh, 149, please. And I'm definitely going to uh, get into trying to play a 10, an 8, and a 12. They make an 8 inch drum, a Steve Jordan drum, and they make a 12 of this kind as well. And a lot of this jungle music uses multiple snare hits. Again, because it's so easy to just sample three snare drums for this music and program three snare drums. But when I've done gigs and I've used two snare drums, it really highlights, uh, it gives you another, another voice to go to and another level to bring it to. So yeah, two, uh, two snare drums will be in order. But this is a 10 inch by, I guess, four. Doesn't sound bad, does it? Sounds okay. It sounds like a piccolo, pretty much. Sounds like a piccolo. Um, pretty close. Pretty close. I'm going to have to experiment with it. I've never used a lot of piccolos, but if it does, I, I might start. <laughs> because uh, this is a hard surface to hit. It's too small, but it gets the sound I want. Um, but it's the same depth as a piccolo, I guess. But then again, when you mic things and EQ them, you can do anything you want to stuff. But uh, yeah, 10 inch drum. Yeah. What was the last style of music that you just played? <laughs> what was it what we call? What category? You name it. You, 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 <laughs> your guess is as good as mine. Um, drum laughing. <laughs> laughing music. Uh, no, um, the thing I just played was in two parts, and neither of them I could like label. The first thing I, I, I kind of dis would describe as fusiony techno jungle, okay. just to put a label to it. Right. And the second one I would describe as kind of a hip hoppy feel, then kind of done whatever I wanted to do with it. Let me uh, do the bass help you out some with your timing when you go into your own little thing a lot of times. That's, that's, I'm relying heavily on the bass on that track because where I was doing a lot of those solos, there was no other pulse but the bass. And I know the bass line of this tune good enough to know where it's being placed uh, and to use that as an anchor, definitely, and the chords and all that stuff. Uh, you don't, you know, good question. When you play stuff, especially when you do this stuff with a band and there's no sequences, really, rely on those guys don't don't like always feel you have to 
generate the pulse. They're musicians too, and they, they have a time feel. And um, if you shut yourself off to like those other elements, you're not doing yourself a favor. You're making it only harder on yourself. So, but that's a good question. It's the best question of the clinic. He gets a pin. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a very musical question. I like that. Um, yeah, so that's the deal. Well, I'm going to play one more tune to finish up. And this one, again, would be considered in the hip hop -y type vein. Uh, I'll play one more that kind of highlights these. And I want to definitely uh, thank Zildjian for bringing me here, and as well, Shore Microphones, which are making it so that you can hear this really loud and it hurts everybody's ears. You can thank them for that now. Uh, Shore Microphones that. It really is a must, I think, to have drums mic'd when playing to this stuff because you want to get a sound that sort of has that sort of process thing. And I know a few times I've tried to play this music where the drums weren't mic'd and it just doesn't sound great. So basically, yeah, you got to buy yourself these cymbals, you got to buy yourself all these microphones, samplers, keyboards, you know, all take loans out for $35,000 that we can never repay. And uh, <laughs> something like that. Or you could buy one of those for $25,000 or whatever. No, $36,000. So, I'm going to give this last tune a whirl, and, what's that? Dual channel. No. And, and I want to just thank everyone for coming. Thanks a lot.
Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming.